Uh, I begin this morning with a very familiar passage, a passage that many of you, uh, of you have heard. It's called the Great Commission. Uh, ironically, though, this uh, passage, uh, the Great Commission, is the passage we talk about in when we send out missionaries. Uh, George Barna recently did a survey and, and they asked uh, the churches what the Great Commission was. And actually over 50% of Christians did not even know what the Great Commission was. And so here is the Great Commission. This is the very last thing that Jesus commissions the disciples to. And it's found in verse 18 of Matthew. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Imagine, uh, the year is 2027. And in this year, uh, for the past two decades, society is on the verge of collapse. And the main cause of this collapse is human infertility. No one is able to give birth. And as people are getting older, no babies are produced. And one day a refugee is found to be pregnant. And one man does everything he can to save this woman uh, who bears the hope of humanity in her belly. Well, this is actually a premise of a movie that uh, was written from a book by P.D. James called The Children of Men. Uh, it stars this uh, actor named Clive Owen, and, and in this movie, uh, the basis of this uh, uh, movie was actually from Psalm uh, 90, verse 3. The woman who wrote this said this, What thou uh, trust, turnest men to destruction, saying, Return you children of men. By the way, uh, P.D. James was a Catholic, a Roman Catholic woman, and she wrote this book to describe sort of the state of humanity. It was a spiritual allegory of Christianity conquering this hopeless sort of nihilism that existed in society. But as I was watching this movie, a, a thought stirred in, in my head. As the theme of infertility comes up, it's what if society cannot bear children? Well, in one generation, society would almost disappear and collapse. But then I thought about a, a, a spiritual question. What if churches do not reproduce and we have spiritual infertility? What if disciples are not being made? What if we're not producing spiritual babies? What would happen to Christianity? And the same exact scenario would happen that we would see the collapse of, of Christianity. What's interesting is that throughout, uh, 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 sort of in America where, I, where I'm ministering, one of the questions that, that we're asking is, where is the gospel uh, going f in, in the future? And as you look at sort of the, the societal trends that are happening, uh, George Barna, who is a, a, a person who does a lot of data collecting, he had an interesting statistic. He says that atheism has doubled among Generation Z. He points out that out of all the generations that are coming up, and we have all these X and Y, and now we are uh, having Generation Z, that Generation Z is the most atheistic generation in the history of mankind. In other words, atheism has doubled among the general population and among general Generation Z churchgoers, the perception of the church is negative rather than positive. One of the sad realities is that my children who are part of this generation, they have friends who have never been exposed to the gospel. We're living in very different times. And so how are we as Christians to respond? Are we to respond by just ignoring the next generation that's coming up? Or are we supposed to engage with that next generation? And I think one of the things that we have to look back to is, is what is the commission that Jesus has called us? Has Jesus called us just to be comfortable amongst ourselves and just to be inward focused? And there's nothing wrong with the inwardness of the church in the sense that we need fellowship, we need community. One of the growing needs of, of our generation is the need for a, a, a extended family. Because the family has, has been falling apart uh, globally, that the church becomes, in some sense, a surrogate family to the culture around us. And so we need a healthy base. We need a healthy family. But we need more than just a family where we're just content with ourselves. One of the purposes of a family is to reproduce and multiply. And so we believe that to change the world, that really is not about us changing the world. It's about the mission of the gospel changing the world. 
And so what I want to talk about today is really going back to the Great Commission that Jesus talks about. As we said, the bad news is that the gospel, um, is, uh, the good news is that the gospel changes the world. And if you think about the impact of the gospel in society, of Christianity, that Christianity has made some a positive influences and impact in society. Uh, Dr. James Kennedy, um, many years ago, was a pastor in Florida, Fort Lauderdale, wrote a book and said, What if Jesus had never been born? And one of the things he talks about in that book is he makes some profound observations on the influence and the impact of Christianity in broader society. He says that Christianity has actually impacted the field of science. The Bible teaches that nature is not, an, is not an illusion, but it's real. It teaches us to work with nature, understand that it's part of God's creation. Church uh, Christianity has contributed to human freedom and human rights. We are to engage in the rights of others, and we are to the ones who are to be on the forefront of that. And we saw that happen in England with William Wilberforce. Christianity has contributed to morality in culture, where we believe there is right and wrong. Christianity is what brought dignity back to the orphans and slaves. In the Roman culture, by the way, babies were tossed and they were considered uh, uh, accessories. But the churches were the ones that embraced the poor, it were the ones who embraced the orphans. And as a result, we were the ones who established hospitals in culture. Christianity has contributed to health care. Christians were the one on the front lines of health care, especially ministering to those who were outside of, 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 of health. And you see people that they were taking in lepers. They were taking in people with diseases who were dying, who were sick. And lastly, Christianity has contributed to education. One of the interesting things about Christianity is that when they established churches, they would also establish hospitals and establish schools. If you think about the impact of Christianity, think about what has happened here in Korea. That the influence of all these things has transformed this nation. That in the early 1900s, this country was, was a country that was so far from the gospel. And yet now, in the, in the 21st century, this is a place in which the gospel goes forth. That Korea has become the second leading nation in the world of sending out missionaries globally. All happened because the gospel took root in this little country. So without a doubt, Jesus has influence and impact the society in a positive way. But I believe that every one of us has a role to play in the mission of God. That God has called us not just to be content with ourselves, but He has called us to multiply. And what I want to talk about today is I believe that the sole mission of the church is multiplication. That multiplication happens on an individual level, it happens on a small corporate level, but it also happens on a larger level corporate matter as well. So one of the things that we want to see is that multiplication is part of God's design. And that's the first thing we see here in, in uh, Matthew chapter 28 verse 18. Jesus says this, Then He called, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Me. Therefore go and make disciples. The first thing here is that Jesus sort of gives the authority to us. He passes the baton. And if you want to understand the work of Jesus, you have to understand that from God's very uh, design, from the very beginning, was the design of multiplication. So we see multiplication at, at the very first command, Genesis 1.28, where God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now we know that in Genesis 1.28 it was about physical multiplication. It was the uh, subduing of the earth and multiplying. But one of the interesting things here is that multiplication and fruitfulness tie together. That as we multiply, we are bearing the fruit of God. And we see that multiplication was part of God's uh, plan from the very beginning. And of course, from, from a human biological sense, that multiplication is really innately, uh, biologically, uh, our, our design. That how do you know something's a living organism is, is that we multiply. And yet, one of the things that we're seeing is that when we don't multiply, we're actually uh, not being fruitful and not being faithful, but we're actually hurting ourselves. You know, uh, one of the statistics I give, I teach at a seminary called Talbot Seminary. And I teach one class, church planting, and I taught it here in Korea, I taught it in Singapore. And one of the comments that I make is this, when churches fail to reproduce, ultimately they're killing themselves. And so one of the statistics that came out in the U.S. was this, how many churches, if the church is a living organism, is the body of Christ, and we are meant to reproduce, how many churches in the U.S. actually multiply? And when the numbers came out, it was pretty staggering. 
here's the statistic that 96% of churches in the U.S. do not multiply. Imagine if there's a birth rate of only 4%. Society would ultimately collapse. And that's what's happening in, in America. That's what's happening here, even in Korea, that when churches are desiring just to get bigger and better and not multiplying its impact and influences, we're actually harming the gospel. And so Jesus says, my authority has been given to me. And basically what he's doing is he's passing on the authority to us. And so the question for us is, is how do we then begin the process of multiplication? And the answer is found in the next verse. That multiplication begins by making disciples. You know, one of the things about this passage that's um, the most important verb, actually, in verse 19. Jesus says this, All authority in heaven has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations. Now, oftentimes when we have a mission sermon, we often focus on the word go. Because that's kind of what we do, is we want to send people out. But the main verb, actually, in verse 19 is not going It's actually making disciples. Now, why is that important? Well, the reason that's important is that's our core mission, is to multiply, is to make disciples. And then we do it as we are going wherever God sends us. So making disciples is really the core part of what the church is all about. And so the first challenge I want to give to you is this, that all of you, The job description of every Christian is disciple making. That we are not just to be uh, content with just coming to church on Sunday. That we are to actively engage ourselves by making disciples. So how do you, what does it mean to make, make, make disciples? Well, the idea of making disciples is simply to replicate. Right? To pass the gospel to someone else. Now, when we think of discipleship, oftentimes we think of a class that we go to, we think of some sort of form. Well, really, discipleship is you investing your life into someone else. And imagine if every one of us did that. If every single one of us multiplied ourselves, multiplied the gospel in us to the people around us, we would change the world. Literally, that's what God calls us to do. Now, it's increasingly becoming difficult because we're living in a very different society where the assumptions of, the, of, of Christianity, especially in, in Western civilization, is, is all disappearing. Uh, the fastest growing group in America uh, of sort of the classification of religious people are called the nuns. These are people that have no religious affiliation at all. They are so growing so fast that, that they're actually going to become one of the larger religious groups in the world. In other words, people who are non-religious are, are becoming... And so part of the problem has been the church. That we have not focused on reaching those people who are outside. Instead, we have become sort of insular. We've become all about ourselves. And so in America, what we have celebrated was, is nationalism, sort of Christianity embossed, uh, sort of engraved or ingrained in this sort of nationalistic religion. And we have lost the power of the gospel because of that. And so part of my challenge to you, and this is why I'm so excited to be at Gospel City, is that the, the, the way we sort of remove ourselves from nationalism is we focus ourselves on, on globalism, that, that God is working beyond just one nation, that our identity is not in our identity in the country that we're from, that our identity is based in a bigger identity, it's in the kingdom of God. You know, one of the things that excites me uh, of, of being in part of an international church is that you are truly the representation of the world. You are the fulfillment of the Great Commission. When Jesus says, go and make disciples, He says it to all the nations, and you guys are doing that. And as you are doing that, as you are making disciples, you are now becoming the catalyst for reaching people. And one of the things that's happening is this, that globally, God is on the move. You know, sometimes living in America, you sort of get discouraged because at one time, the U.S. was, was one of the nations in which the gospel was, was, was going forth. And in some ways, it still is, but in many ways, it's lost its sort of fervor and passion for that. But where you see the gospel at move are places that you would not expect. According to um, um, Open Door Ministries, one of the, the, the fastest growing places where the gospel is moving Is in, some, is in a nation that none of us would even would be in the top 10. But the top nation that the gospel is moving as is in Iran. Now some of us would be surprised that Iran would be even a place where the, where the gospel would even move forward because there's such oppression with the gospel. In one story in Iran, there was a, a pastor named 
uh, Mehdi uh, Dibaja, and he's an Assemblies of God minister. And he spent 10 years in prison uh, for his faith. And he was a convert from Islam in 1955. And they kept on putting him in prison. They, they first, he, they, he was asked to sign a paper admitting he was wrong and that he wanted to return to Islam. He, did not, he rejected that. So he was beaten, he was tortured, and he was put through mock execution. His wife eventually succumbed to uh, the pressure of Islam and she converted back. She marries another man and his children are taken away and he still doesn't recant his faith. He's offered freedom for exchanging, for admitting that he is mentally unstable. And he still doesn't deny that. And, and we know what happens in prison. He begins to share his faith with other prisoners. And the gospel begins to spread in that prison. In 1977, there were only 2,700 evangelicals in Iran out of a population of 45 million. Of these, only 300 were former Muslims. Today, there are close to 50,000 believers, of whom 27,000 are from Muslim backgrounds. If you think about the population of what, what's happening in places like Iran, the gospel is moving forward, it's transforming people. But here's the thing that I think is, is, is most neglected. It's individual disciple making is critical, and we need to do that, but what's also important is corporate multiplication as well. And here's the interesting thing about the Great Commission. The multiplication happens when we multiply groups and churches. Now, notice what uh, is said here in verse 19. Go, Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Now, oftentimes when we look at this passage, we read it from an individual sort of lens, that it's about me making an impact in one person's life. But Tim Keller actually makes a, a different point. He says this, this is really not about individual uh, discipleship, really what this is, is a call to plant churches. In other words, it's about corporate discipleship. That really the way in which we impact the nations is not just by multiplying individuals, by multiplying groups and churches. He says that this was an essential call to plant churches. Virtually all the great evangelistic passages of the New Testament are basically calls to plant churches, not simply to share their faith. The Great Commission is not just about making disciples, but to baptize. In the Acts and elsewhere, baptism was a means of incorporation. In other words, if you look at the context of that passage, what Jesus is talking about is developing a healthy body in which baptism and teaching can be done. And that's what the church is. And so what I want to challenge you guys this morning is simply this. Don't be comfortable in just becoming bigger. But instead, be passionate about multiplying yourself, multiplying groups, and looking outward. And here's the most uh, important statistic, that the most effective way to carry out the gospel is by planting new churches. Because when you're planting a church, what you're doing is you are establishing a new body of Christ in that community. You know, when I thought about church planting, uh, I grew up in a traditional church. I, I worked under a, a very large mega church pastor in L.A., and I always thought that to be an effective pastor was you just preach a good sermon or, or, or you carry out uh, sort of discipleship programs or you do kind of the ministry of the church. And all those things are important and, and they, those are good things. But I remember when God called me out to Washington, D.C. So I, was, I grew up in L.A. and the Lord called me to, to D.C. And, and I was part of this large Korean church where I was pastoring an English congregation. And one day... Um, I was talking to my young adult who was a Korean American, since it was a Korean American church, and I said to this person, why don't you invite your non-Korean to come to church, your co-workers? And they kind of looked at me and they kind of gave me this, like, what are you talking about? I can't do that. And so I said, why can't you bring your friend to church? And this person said, well, because they're not Korean American. It was a Korean American church. But I said, the gospel is open to all people. And he said, well, they're going to feel uncomfortable. And at that point, I realized that, that the church that, that I was a part of was actually a limitation to the people that I wanted to reach. Living in D.C., one of the things that, that you have the opportunity is to see all the different nations represented. So as I was driving through DuPont Circle, I saw all the different embassies and different flags of different countries. And as I was looking at those different flags, I said, what's missing is the flag of the kingdom of God. What we need is an embassy for God's kingdom. And that's what the church should be. 
The church, in some sense, is to be an embassy, to be an ambassador for Christ. So, as I was reading through the Bible, 2 Corinthians 5.20, it came to the verse that so says that we are Christ's ambassadors, carrying on the message of reconciliation. Be reconciled to God. And so what happened was I took that passage and I left that Korean church. It was a stable ministry. And by the way, what Lisa shared was perfect. That, that if you want to be moved by God, sometimes you have to take a risk. And it's not easy because sometimes you have to give up the comforts to sort of be disrupted because that's where faith is at. And so I, I left my Korean church and I started this little Bible study in my apartment. Um, and it was a high rise uh, near DC in Falls Church, Virginia. And I remember we had 11 people meeting there and we started our first Sunday service and we had um, uh, 22 people. And everybody it was BYOC, bring your own chairs because we didn't have enough. So people would bring their chairs literally into the elevator. They would climb up and they would sit down. And we would sit in a circle. We had a little keyboard and we would sing and we would worship. It, it was going like for me like the book of Acts. We're just worshiping freely. And we asked the simple prayer, Lord, help us to impact this nation by impacting with the church that you are going to establish. So with those 11, church, 11 people, uh, we planted Ambassador uh, Bible Church in near Washington, D.C. Last year, uh, they invited me back. I had left the church after we planted, and they invited me back. It was their 20th anniversary service. And I got to speak at this church. Uh, 20 years that had been planted, and the church is four or five hundred people meeting in a, a city called Chantilly, and they're thriving. They've been sending out missionaries all across. And I realized something that the baby that was planted there 21 years, 20 years ago, and 21 years now, is now multiplying and furthering the gospel. And when I went to LA three years later after that, we planted uh, our second ambassador church. And then from our church, we've planted uh, 10 other churches. And every time we've planted a church or we, we multiplied our service, what we were doing was we were extending and expanding the work of God. And so my next prayer was simply this, Lord, um, help me to uh, impact the kingdom by, by investing myself into others. And that's when I met Pastor Joe a few years ago and met uh, Pastor Sangmin and, and a few others. And then most recently, uh, I met a few young pastors in Sydney, Australia, and they invited me there. And that's why I'm, I'm here is because I was mentoring a bunch of young leaders there. And here's the thing about the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God does not begin big. It always begins small. One of my favorite parables is the parable about the, about the uh, mustard seed. In Matthew chapter 13, 31, Jesus says this, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it's the smallest of all seeds, when it grows, it is the largest of the garden plants. And it becomes a tree, so that even the birds come and perch in its branches. Jesus talked about the expansion of God's kingdom starting from a little seed. And I believe this is what Gospel City is all about. That you guys are the seed in which you are being planted and rooted in the city. That through this church, you are starting to bear fruit. And as, as the tree begins to grow, somebody said, what's the fruit of an apple tree? Now, most of us would say it's an apple. But he said, the fruit of an apple tree is not an apple, but it's another apple tree. That the goal of an apple is to become seed so that it can become another tree. The goal of an apple tree is not to become just a, a tree that bears apples, but it's to become part of an orchard that multiplies and expands and becomes part of something bigger. And that's what Gospel City is all about. The Gospel transforming people, cultures, and cities. I think about how the Gospel always begins. It doesn't begin by being large, it actually begins by being small. Rich uh, Stearns was a former uh, um, president of World Vision. He tells a story about what he calls the domino theory. And he says this, how do we make spiritual impact? So many of us think that spiritual impact happens when we are doing these large things, large events, global things like crusades and, and all these, you know, sort of being on television. The bigger the platform, the bigger the impact. That's sort of our mindset. But in reality, what Stern says is that oftentimes the greatest impact happens from a small little group of people. 
he calls them dominoes. He says, imagine if you set up 12 little dominoes and then you knock it over and, and a movement begins to happen. If you've ever seen an illustration, actually a small little domino like about this size and you put it next to a little bit of a bigger one and a bigger one, eventually that little domino has enough momentum and power to knock over eventually a, a domino the size of a building. Why? Because that's the way in which the gospel works. And he says this, in 1880, he gives a story. There was a man named Robert Wilder. Robert Wilder was a missionary kid from India, and he was preparing to go on the mission field. Because he grew up there, and, and he uh, had a desire to go back to India. But during college, he got sick. And he couldn't fulfill the pledge that he made to go to India. And so he decided, instead of going to India, that he would be the one that would call others to India, or others to mission. Because he couldn't fulfill his pledge, he wanted others to do that. And during one of his preaching assignments, he went to Chicago, and a young man named Robert was there. Uh, I'm sorry, a young man named Samuel was there. His name was Samuel Moffat. And Samuel signed Robert's pledge, and within two years, he landed in this small little obscured country called Korea, and another domino fell. A few years later, Samuel shared the gospel with a man who became disillusioned with Taoism, uh, and his name was Kil Sun Chu. And Kil Sun Chu trusted Christ, and quickly another domino fell. In 1907, Kil was one of the leaders of what they call the Pyongyang Revival. In January of that year, spontaneous prayer and confession broke out during a regular church meeting. Thousands and thousands of dominoes fell. During the early years, as the prayer movement began, an independent church was given birth in Korea. When Kil Sun Chu died in 1935, over 5,000 people attended his funeral. The church in Korea now numbers over 15 million. It sends out more foreign mis missionaries than any other country next to uh, America. Think about this. A small little domino started this whole movement. And I believe that the church of Christ, that's the way it happens. That we need a catalyst for the kingdom of God. By the way, um, do you know how you start a revolution? You don't start a revolution by getting everybody involved. Actually, revolutions are begun by what they call the 10%. Um, in a Polytech Institute in America, they did an interesting study. And uh, a man named Malcolm Gladwell writes about it. He says, the way you impact any organization or any society is not by influencing the 90%. He says that the key to transforming anything is the 10%. And according to a study by these scientists, once 10% of the population is committed to an idea, it's inevitable that it will eventually become the prevailing opinion of the entire group. He says the difference between the 90 and the 10 is simply this, that the 10% we're the most committed. And those who are the most committed will eventually wear out the non-committed. And I think about how the gospel of 12 disciples transformed the whole Roman Empire. It's because the gospel allowed them to see a commitment that was bigger than this worth earthly reality. That we have a gospel that is eternal. And that you bear something that is eternal. And what all that is happening in the US, all that's happening globally, that no matter how many peace accords we sign, no matter how much money or pros prosperity we wear, all those things don't lead to the very thing that we desire. You know, when you think about what's happening even in, in, among popular culture, and you hear people like Anthony Bourdain, or you hear uh, of women like Kate Spade taking their life, who have everything you could imagine. And yet the thing that they were missing in their own life was the most thing that, that we have. And so I challenge you to don't be content with who you are. Don't be content in just filling this room. Be content with what God is doing in you and through you to be the agents of multiplication. Yes, be a healthy community. Be a community that loves one another to demonstrate to the world that this is a true family of God. But be, don't be content with just by being that. That the God that God has called us to be a transforming agent happens all across. And I believe if this church is doing what it's doing, you're going to be planting churches, not only here in Korea, but you're going to be planting churches in all across Europe, all across Asia, all across Greece, all across America. Wouldn't it be great that if this becomes the domino that begins that chain reaction? Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray.